Hello, everyone. David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. This is episode number 45. Hope you're all doing very well. Um, I have a great guest today. I have Greg, Gregory Hawthorne. Gregory is the name that Google has given him here in front of me or his his email has given me. Um, but Greg Hawthorne, Greg, I actually first met Greg or the only time I met Greg was actually at our Florida workshop this year, our uh, lower limb biomechanics rehab and performance workshop. So Greg came to that and um, super smart guy really got on very very well and then over a few beers he was telling me about his we make sure we have a couple of beers on the saturday night and the sunday night of the workshop um not too many but a few and uh, he was telling me about like a couple of projects he or courses and things that he was working on um and i said why don't you come on the podcast and we have a chat about stuff so that's what we did um we spoke about like compression expansion model a little bit narrow and wide ISAs, the movement of the guts uh how the kind of sloshing around of the guts how that impacts our movement in change of direction and things like that um the different structures that you'll see and what those structures like wider shoulders narrower shoulders wider hips narrower hips what's happening there what 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 strengths and weaknesses might be associated with those structures so all all things like that i think it's super 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 important information and honestly it has informed my coaching practice that type of information and honestly it has helped me make, make better decisions and more accurate decisions i think by having an understanding and awareness of this stuff so um i really really enjoyed the chat with greg today and uh, i think you're going to enjoy it too as always if you do give us a shout out and uh, help the podcast grow and we'll be able to keep getting on great guests so without further ado here's greg hawthorne when do you think was the minute i decided i think I sh- you should come on the podcast when we were talking uh, at, at, with tacos, is that what it's time? The taco time or not? No. I was asking questions. No, when you chug the beer. Oh, was that was that it? That was it. was a free beer, right? It, it was, <laughs> was it a free beer? It was weird. They overfoured the shock top, and I'm like, well, I'll just take that. <laughs> it tastes like water, anyway. It's a light, light beer. Was that, oh. that that was it? You're like this that guy, was, this, guy was, this is my guy. <laughs> stuff if you can if you can do that relax <laughs> so you know because i always like but well, not always but i think i just went like chug it or something like that which i just randomly say and then i turned around and then i turned back around and it was gone <laughs> 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 so i was like he oh, did a party it. trick in college that was what, that's what uh i'm not gonna lie so that was that is a thing that people were like holy sh- holy shit you can you can chug a beer. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's this guy can chug a beer, hundred percent. That's how I drink all my fluids. Like, it's that's why I, don't, <laughs> I don't drink my coffee hot because that's literally how I drink my coffee. I drink it in the morning. I leave, go do something, come back down the hatch. <laughs> I'm more of a sipper. That's cool. um, okay. So I think we we'll talk about like your kind of lens for looking at movement first. I think Greg. So when I I was thinking about this actually, I had a walk before the podcast, and when I look at movement, I think I think I don't know. I don't separate things out. But like, if I was to try and separate it, things out, it would probably be, okay, I'm looking at like the bones. I'm thinking first, like what are, what way are the bones moving and someone like someone's structure, gravity, ground reaction forces, maybe a little bit around the fluid dynamics. That's more of a recent thing. Um, and then I probably layer in on top of that in my own mind, like this isn't a hierarchy or layers necessarily, but then I might start to think about like muscles, connective tissue, things like this. I think a more traditional model would be people just thinking like, okay, mobility and strength. I just, they don't even think of like coordinative aspects or sensory aspects or anything like that. It's like joint space and then muscle strength of the muscle. That's it. What, what, what way could you maybe describe, which is a difficult question, how you would maybe look at things. So I also, yeah, I came from, I grew up in the FMS world. You know, one of the first courses I ever took uh, outside of school was like FMS, right? And so very much mobility, strength, like that was that was where I grew up. And I you know you get some results with that for sure, right? There's no, there's no, you do something that's different, you're going to get changes. Um, so I've evolved since then. Um, it's something more along the lines, same idea where it's, I think like, all right, what, when I look at someone move, I'm like, what are they trying to do? First thought is in my head, like, what are they trying to do? What are their goals? And it depends on like, are they in pain? I'm not in pain, but like, what are the goals and what have they been doing? I usually try to go history first. And this is probably a medical background um, with, with athletes and things like that. Um, and then from there, it's like, well, well, how did you get there? Like, what did you do to get there? And then 
And so I'm looking at him like, you've done all this and you're trying to go here, but you've done all this in the past to get there. And, and now it goes into bony position. I'm also with that. But, the, you know, I, when I say how are you going to get there and what you did, this is a really hard question. I'm not going to lie. I never thought. I know, but it's fine. It doesn't have to be perfectly structured right. either, you know? Because yeah, so. I'm going to have to throw in there at some point within all this, neurology is always in my head. Yeah, like, I don't know how to, where to fit it in there because it's always everlasting, right? The body is be driven by the nerves. Like that's the, that's the stuff um, that puts these, the bones in position that does all this. So, but it's all based on, again, what were you trying to do? What was your life at history? So that, that's why I'm really going with the history thing is like, all right, so where they are probably mentally, um, where their brain are, where they're comfortable with, where all these nerves are uh, doing within themselves. And then I look at, I do look at bony position first, right? So I'm like, what are the bony position? And it's more of what positions can they achieve? And then how is that gonna affect everything else online? And then once they're there, it's like, well, why can't they get into the positions that they desire or produce the positions or move the way they want to based on bony positioning and then the connective tissues and the muscles, how they affect that and what's their, how are they preventing, why are they preventing certain changes within the body, certain shapes the body can take, certain positions the body can get into. And so I go into there and that thought process then goes kind of goes down into uh, and, but when I th see, this is where I think about that now, that's automatically fluid mechanics. That's automatically neural stuff. That's automatically in my head at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I could flush that out for sure. Um, mm -hmm. If I were to write it down, I would have to write it down because I would over time myself. <laughs> um, more so, I'm sure I haven't written down like throughout the course. Like, again, how I teach it is like each, each course of my, mm -hmm. uh, my master in the master class I teach. When you talk uh, about this stuff, you just end up talking yourself into circles because 100%. you can't, it's very hard to separate. Like, you can't mm -hmm. separate bony position from strength length tension relationships from fluid dynamics from 100%. neurology all that stuff they all feed into each other and vice versa yeah. and so as much as it's really hard to see but i do look at it differently from a i were to look at it from a mobility to strengths like over we work with mobility versus strength it's i can't go just that simple because it's it, it all depends you can have strength with crazy mobility right you get but it depends on how you train it depends on like now your wiggle room. And I say this like, so you have eccentric strength, so like Nordic, so you're a big thing, right? We're doing Nordic, we're doing Nordic. It, it makes you stronger in a longer hamstring position, there's no doubt. You're driving changes, visual adaptations to the tissues to create longer sarcomeres. And also, but then that's also going to lead to a certain position which you're gonna have a hard time achieving, which may limit you in other activities. But now you have these long hamstrings, if you will, that are pretty strong. But when you shorten them, odds are they're not going to be nearly as strong now as you would like them to be based on position. So now you're weak in other positions. So you, you have mobility and strength there, but now you lose it somewhere else. Like you lose something somewhere else where, uh, and then that's based on the connective tissues, like stiffness versus the contractile elements, stiffness versus the fluid within there. The wiggle room's a little bit less, most likely within a, that area. Like you overstress there, you odds are you're at that point where you're, you're tight because you're stretched versus tight because you're the, the contractile elements are firing, it's not neurological anymore. Um, and so it's, there's those things come into play when it comes to trying to look at the whole model. That's why like the straight up mobility versus strength thing is, is difficult. It's not, it's too simplified mm -hmm. to get great use out of it. You know, it, cause you could always make someone stronger usually in certain position. You can always make someone more mobile from a certain position. It's just where are they getting that mobility from at this point and how are they deriving the strength? How are they producing that strength? And then depending on their goals, you may get what you want, but you may not. And so understanding the more complicated, again, it doesn't have to be overly complicated, but again, oversimplifying is also a bad idea. Mm -hmm. A more complicated way of, hey, look, I need to find out where I'm producing force, how my body's set up, how my contractor elements or the muscles are doing their job uh, to create a force that I want. And now I, now, now I have ability through these things and knowing where you're getting it from is probably more important than just getting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, that, that, that comes back to like even a very simple thing. Like people, if you look at someone that I would have traditionally said, oh, that person is really mobile or really flexible years, years back, it would have been based on, okay, they can palm the floor in a toe touch. They can, and they can do front splits and side splits. That's yep. that and automatically that person. I I've just tech ch check them off in my head. They're really mobile, but like how they actually achieve that position two people could be very, very, look very, very different how they achieve those types of positions. So I, 
that's one of my issues with yoga to be honest is yeah. that it's just they just have certain positions and if you get into them you're good at yoga and if you don't you're not good at yoga and uh i think the journey into those positions is what's probably more important to be honest um okay so start off then with structure for me so when you look at bony position and the different types of structures can you talk a little bit about what you're what you're looking for there and maybe 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 if you want like how you measure how you measure it or how you just decipher or how you bracket people into different things so i'm i'm a, I'm a again i'm a so i've done a lot of computer ed i don't i don't choose one camp per se um however i do i do like what bill hartman does like huge 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 influence on me um and so like, I, do, I do look at wide person narrowing for sternal angle um and, and from the archetype but then based on me it's going to be more of the shape they take outside of that. So if you're looking at an individual and I'm looking at someone, I'm trying to see are they wider up top or wider at bottom at the hips and pelvis. So it's like, are they a triangle or are they like a funnel? Okay. And that's gonna help drive the on top of that archetype. So look at the archetype first. Are they, you know, wide versus narrow? And that's a general shape change, right? So when I look at someone like that, I'm like, are they, are they like super? I mean, it's literally simple. You can look at someone and it's like, how wide like, do they have a really high rib cage or like shoulder kind of wide? Do they look like they turn well? And that's, a, that's kind of the simple way to look at it. Or, or, or do they look like they, they, they don't turn around, right? So, and you'll see people, they'll have these general, like, oh, this guy's kind of skinny. They usually have a longer head, um, a, a more narrow jaw. Like, it's just, like, there's so many, like, you just look at them, but put it simply, I'm sure we can go into measurements. Um, and I, I do, I'll measure the infrasternal angle, and I'll do that with my thumbs underneath. And so, from that point, I'm also wrapping my hands around the rib cage, and I'm feeling how flat they are or how round it is. That's going to tell me some information. And then at the same time, when I'm there, let me go freeze here. At the same yeah. time, while I'm there, I, did, is that where I stopped? I lost you for a sec. Yeah. So, so you have a, a wider, wider ISA, a narrower ISA, and then you have the someone with wider shoulders and a narrower pelvis, and then you have someone with narrower shoulders and a wider pelvis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. And That's why? Why is that? Why, why is that important? Because that's gonna be that's gonna lead to essentially their ability to produce like force within the, the, the body or like how they're going to be able to manipulate the internal pressures. So if you imagine like uh, so your diaphragm is it takes up you know your whole section right it literally cuts things off from the diaphragm up whole separate section diaphragm down whole separate section and so it has a set size based on the canister it's in. So how big is your trampoline? Um, and do I have a trampoline that is set for like nice and long or do I have one that's wide and pulled tight? If that makes sense. So a trampoline is going to either have a, again, springier or less springy. And then what you're pushing it into is your pelvic floor, which also has a trampoline. Um, your pelvic diaphragm, that pelvic floor also has a trampoline, same idea. So you have these two tissues fighting each other. Now, based on the size of that, so like, is your bowl now, your diaphragm, is it bigger or smaller than the part above? If I have a small bowl, compared to the top ball. So like the, the pelvic floor is lower, smaller, the pelvis is smaller than the line, rib cage. When I push down, pressure is going to build immediately, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm pushing a lot of stuff into this little ball and that's going to automatically drive pressure back up. So I'm pushing, I'm, I'm pushing against the pelvis, which is going to allow me to essentially get off the floor a lot sooner. I'm going to be a little more bounce here. I'm going to have a little bit more ability because my diaphragm, my guts are constantly getting pushed back up constantly because I have this, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting it. That can lead to its own issues in the end. Where vice versa, if I'm trying to do something heavy and I have this small diaphragm, this wider pel pelvis, I have to push super far down into that to get a pressure that I need to essentially fight back. It's harder for that bottom part to push in because I'm constantly having to push it push down. So in order to build that pressure enough in the bottom part to push things back up, I have to sink really low. So now, one, it's going to be hard to lift things up, and the excursion is probably going to be pretty small in regards to how much movement I actually have because in order to do things, I have to constantly have that pressure manipulating but because i want to maintain a certain amount within my you know we think about interdominal pressure whatever it is but the constant flow of movement um will go up and down within the pelvis and so i won't have as much because i'm constantly having to maintain a certain pressure but also because of that i can't move things up and down and i said this before like on, on, on instagram and things like if you've ever harvested an animal if you will uh so like a butcher or hunting or did anything the weight of the legs, arms, they're, they're almost negligible. 
but you you go to those guts that's where everything is like mm-hmm. there's so much weight internally in an animal like it's just I, we do I, 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 uh, we raise goats and for meat goats and I butcher goats and like it's so heavy but if you're done like oh that's easy there's nothing left once you once you cut them they're super light and it's like we're the same thing like there's so much weight in turn, and guess what they it just goes where it tells right, where the body forces it to go and if we don't have control of that which is a, with this whole diaphragm in the you're not going to have control of your movement and so where your guts go you're going to go and so that's why that pelvis shape or this the the shape of wide versus narrow ribs versus pelvis matters a ton when it comes to performance aspects and this is like a very performance driven aspect thing or what someone's going to be good at doing right mm-hmm. a lot of wider wider hip people narrow short people they're pretty good lifters um they tend to be able to hit range of motions decently um femur length can change things a little bit but they tend to be able to put you know they they they're if they're going to be good at anything they're going to put force on the ground they're going to have really big legs um because of just how the force is on them and but their their jumping ability probably isn't great right they may be okay vertical uh, horizontally running um but their vertical stuff is is, is pretty good. better accelerators not necessarily not actually great high great, great top speed guys things like that all those things will kind of play into it uh based and that's based on just structurally how they are can you manipulate that a little bit yeah but they're never going to be the way someone who's the opposite is, right? And the further you go in either direction, the further, the less wiggle room you're going to have in regards to manipulating what their ability is to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, get, get out of those certain positions. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Let me recap and, and ask a couple of questions there. So uh, so someone with a, with a narrower pelvis, let's say, let's say I have a bowl on my table, smaller, a smaller, narrower bowl, I have a glass of water, which is like the fluid and let's say just imagine the guts then inside me is the glass of water i pour that into the bowl that that smaller bowl fills up quicker that you're you're saying that's someone who can pressurize much quicker and then that that pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm is going to push back up it, it doesn't it's it pressurizes much quicker and it pushes up quicker and yes. in theory then that person might be someone who's a little bit more reactive yes very much so and you'll Perfect. see it anywhere like yeah. even like like that structure, you're usually going to see like longer tendons, longer things like this systemically. So then like their whole body starts to feed into it. Don't know why necessarily that is, but it is that a pretty common occurrence that you'll see? Yeah. So the best jumpers you're probably going to see, they look a little bit more like that. 100%. High jumpers, long jumpers, probably a lot of, a lot of basketball players as well. Yep. And then the opposite of that is that wider bowl which I pour in the water. I have to keep pouring and pouring and pouring and it takes longer to fill up. But those people maybe are better squatters then or, or things like that. They can, they, they take a little bit more time to build pressure, but they can still build the pressure. It just takes longer. Depending on like how far into it. Yeah. So you I mean, you can always build pressure, but mm-hmm. it, now it depends on like you go a certain way. Um, it may get too far, right? Mm-hmm. It, may, it may be so, it may be difficult, but yes, they're going to be a little bit better at, putting heavier force into the ground and but it's just slower it's a slower buildup which you know which is okay they're squatting and it's not a big deal but they they tend to have it uh it's like thicker legs um and because they, they're constantly pushing force into the ground they're never coming off the ground it's okay it's also okay for them be, for uh like counter movement jumps they can they can sink down lower and push they're back up and lower. use their them, strength want them to sink down lower i run to that mm-hmm. some of the guys here who play basketball who have this progression they're like oh he jumps really high like you're not gonna jump with him yeah. It's like, you just don't try to do what he does. And so I utilize, so just to show them, so I use like a jump mat. I would do a counter movement jump. And I'm like, you got to sink deeper. I'm like, you should sink deeper and you jump to get higher. You should sink deeper. And they're like, oh, I don't get it. Then they'll do a seated box jump and they're, they'll be an inch higher or two inches higher. I'm like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to jump higher from a seating position than you were with a counter movement. You should have jump higher with a counter movement um, because of the stretch elasticity, things like that. And I'm like, this is letting me know. It's like you, so there's a good tell. It's like, you need to drop a little bit lower in your counter movement jump to get your counter movement jump higher because you need a little bit more time pushing into the ground to build up the force that you need. You don't load your tendons and your elasticity as well. And you can't build up the force internally as quickly as say this guy who looks like a giraffe, right? Um, yeah. This nice, tall, skinny, who just has a quick little boop and he's just bouncy. Yeah. And so we'll have that conversation and, and they're never going to jump like that. Right. So it's like, if I'm trying to maximize, I want to increase the time they spend on a descent or on the rise, I should say on a descent is what is what it is, but on the rise. Mm-hmm. So you're more, you're more likely to, cause traditionally I would have done, I would think the opposite there where 
that person who needs to sink lower to be able to jump a jump higher, I would traditionally train them to be trying to be more reactive, knowing they're never going to be as reactive as the giraffe person. But if they want to play sport like basketball or something like that, they're going to not have that much time to maybe sink down. No, or are you just thinking about the, okay, you want to jump, you're, we want to measure your counter movement jump. This is the best strategy for you to do that. Right. So like, it, it depends on what they're shooting for. Right. And so, but yes, I will I train them to try to be a little bit more reactive with the understanding of, I only say this when it's, <laughs> you know, it's not like when they're doing the jumps and they're looking at the other person, like, I'm gonna do what he does when you can't do what he does. And you're never yeah. gonna do it. I don't want you to try to do what he does. I want you to do what you do and feel a little bit low. And so I, I do try to make them more reactive. I want to decrease that time, but at the same time, increase that time, if that makes sense, because it's a, yeah, we want to build those fresh movement, but I also understand that when it comes to athletics and some of these athletes, there is a, it's not just about jumping, it's about the whole everything, whole, whole everything, right? But it's just jumping, there's a whole different situation, but I'm doing, I'm doing basketball players or some of us run, cut, drop, stop things. If I push them too hard and try to get them to train like that, it's going to be difficult for them to do a lot of these other things at times, mm-hmm. um, where my whole, like, I'm trying to encompass a whole, a whole athlete versus like a jumper. Mm-hmm. And so like, I'm getting their horizontal force a little bit faster. I'm focused on those things. And then like they're going to be quicker. My goal is to drive quickness uh, and increase their acceleration um, and deceleration a little bit more so than like focusing on the jump with them. But I'm like, if you're trying to get, get bigger numbers, I need you to drop a little bit lower from a score standpoint. Uh, and and, and we're, you're right. I'm not trying to get them to sink all the way down and jump straight up. But there is a point where I need you to go a little bit further down than what you're doing. And like, if they're okay and they're just not jumping inside, that's fine. But if they have that box jump higher, then that for me, that's telling me they're just not, their technique just isn't right yet. Like, even if it's like, even though I know like we need to get them more reactive, they're still trying, their style of jump is just not currently what we want in regards to technique. They're going, they're staying too high. They're not loading enough. They're just yeah. trying to be purely reactive versus like, use your muscle. Like you have it. I see it. You, you have to learn how to utilize it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's uh, it's really interesting i think and this is where the conversation around structures like we're, we're i think we're taught to presume or believe now that like in one way we're told everyone is different but in another way it's like okay everyone just needs to put on more muscle and get stronger and it's not necessarily the case so like i think it's it's so clearly obvious or it should be when you look at different sports that like a basketball player versus a gymnast versus a soccer player versus a bobsledder, they have different structures. They look different. Mm-hmm. So we should be able to observe this and think about what these people's strengths and weaknesses might, might actually be. And then, then we can choose from there. Um, I think, I think that the, the wider pelvis then, for, for example, right, just to stick on this for a few minutes, because I actually think this is really interesting. That person I think uh, that's probably a lot of SNC coaches. First of all, Lots, a lot yeah. of SNC coaches look like that. And I think you could, you can probably train that wider pelvis person by trying to make them more reactive or like way stronger. And they probably respond relatively well to both of those things. If they're, tr- if they're trying to play sport, but you take the person with a narrow pelvis and you try and train them like most SNC coaches train them. I think that can be an issue. And this is where I think it is an issue that yes. SNC coaches are biased. They, 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 they do certain things with athletes because they're good at those things and they saw results with those things. But then they train all of their athletes, presuming that you should train the exact same way. And I've seen a lot of athletes get messed up very quickly because they do not look like the SNC coach. Right. No, I'm with you. I, I, I agree with this. I agree with the statement. That this is one of the things where you not know, basketball's newest for me for the last couple of years, where I, I was a football guy. And uh, in football guys, all shapes and sizes, it's very vertical, horizontally from a movement standpoint, you know, certain guys have to be able to jump, but they can always do it. And so like in a lot of the strength conditioning comes like football, you need armor, right? So you have to build muscle to search because you need it for protection and safety purposes for American football. And so one thing I said, like easy to train football guys and you got to know your stuff, don't get me wrong, but because of their sport, because of what they need to do, because like there's so many different body types, like, you know, they're, but like I said, a lot of these guys are more wider in general like they need to be able to because take force right that's a big part of it is like you're very ever a play where you have a you don't get touched in football right you're literally trying to fight someone off almost every single play every single athlete's trying to do that uh, even quarterbacks at a certain point they have to protect themselves 
it's easy to train them. I got the basketball guys. I'm like, I'm more worried about messing them up than anything else because of like, you know, they'll come to me and I have spring to them. I'm like, all right, I know I don't want to do these certain things. Now I understand how the body works because I may take away from what we're doing. I don't care about, you know, barbell deadlifts at this point. Like, I don't need to go all the way down the floor. You're six, five. Um, you're really long and lean. And I know based on your pelvis shape and things like that, you're not going to have access to some of that internal rotation or the hinge needed. And why would you ever be in that position to begin with? I want you with a hinge. Don't get me wrong. But do I need to do barbell hinge all the way down the floor? Probably not. Single leg hinge is probably more important, like the kickstand. Um, trap bars, I use trap bars. I'll elevate it. I'll do block cleans, you know, block things like that. More so because I'm going to put them in a position that they have access to. At the same time, driving some of the old school traditional things aren't going to give me necessarily the qualities I want. And I do think it's very common to see where we push these athletes into the traditional realm of strength conditioning, where it's like, you know, we're squatting, benching, deadlifting, all the way through and it's like well they don't necessarily need all this from a structural standpoint and from a physiological standpoint like we're, they're, they're, they're designed for this so like enhance that and then give them what they need so that that doesn't just bury them. they have to do the like as before the other aspects of sport um slowing down absorbing forces if you will um to more, more of a dissipation i guess i should say um uh, redirecting forces versus having to always go in one direction and like it's more of that you don't necessarily need a ton of load for that um because of this, their natural spring. Is now again, adding more muscle, adding more ability to get rigid rapidly um, is going to increase your, you know, essentially ceiling at that point. Uh, but I agree. I think a lot of strength SNC athletes, F3 coaches are built similarly, like you said, wider, stronger, built like, and that's traditional. Sorry, yeah, that's traditional. And um, but I, I would agree with you on the fact that it's uh, we need to look a little bit more into it, um, especially as I'm an athlete training through sports medicine, like the injuries you see. It's like, all right, so these guys tend to have these injuries on their back because, you know, you're trying to do these things like spine knees and things a little bit, curl a little bit more narrows. Um, and and, uh, and, um, and so that, that, that's where the issues come to play. And like this, this stuff's going to be a little bit more wide, and lower this stuff wide. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with training and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're starting to get to that point where people are appreciating the different structures. For like, yeah, for a team of like, like, like American football, like in a team of rugby players as well, more, you, you will get like the wingers, the fullback will, will probably look a bit different. Mm -hmm gonna look they're gonna look pretty much the same and they're gonna need a, a ton of armor but then i have like gaelic footballers and the herders herders that i work with all the time i can just i could just see them moving worse before my eyes as this, as seasons progress and it's tricky because they are getting benefits from their snc work like they're getting stronger they're getting faster they're getting fitter but i start to see them picking up niggles and i start to see like I can I can see it on the television or in a game like because I'd be what I would use, I would keep a close eye on some of the players that I've worked with obviously as we all would right so I'm keeping a close eye I'm like that guy is not turning very well mm -hmm. like really not like obviously not turning very well he might he looks like he's faster he's stronger he's filling out his jersey better he can jump higher like off off the ground for a kick out which you don't you can time your run and stuff like that. It's not, it's not necessarily the most reactive thing in the world, but they're just not turning well. And like, that's a big telltale sign to me when turning is a huge part of your sport, being actually able to turn your body and redirect. So, um, so what do you think just, I suppose on that, Greg, what, and this, this is a difficult question as well, but like, so if you take someone that is a bit narrower, maybe, right. And you do train them like that, like traditional SNC, squat bench, deadlift type of thing. What's stopping them from turning as well as they would have before they did some of that work? Oh, so yeah. So if you're putting on a ton of muscle and you're driving these, so like, so in all honesty, you can do all those things and not lose turn. Mm -hmm. If you focus on proper technique whatever that means to so anyway, right? As, as long as you're going through range of motions and you're not cheating. So essentially what happens, you put enough load on somebody and they start to use compensations or they, they use a different technique, put it simply, to lift that weight. 
And in doing so, you start driving muscular changes within the body, you start driving tissue changes within the body. Um, and doing so now these tissue changes so the soft tissue stuff is doing this your body's putting yourself in a certain position so i say we're pinching right you get a little bit of arch in your back to drive that force up now we're looking at the muscles that kind of drive that arch so now we're going to go below the spine like low scapula is a little bit more erector kind of kicking on those muscles start to get learned but when you're moving you're, you're holding that position eventually you're going to get strained you're going to start getting pulled so now you're going to start driving a stiffer tissue and increase the density because you're going to drive more contractile elements in that area same thing idea i'm squeezing here and as I do so, I start to squeeze my shoulder blades back and try to hold this position because I'm trying to create force. I'm trying to lift that weight. That's all right. Um, I lift it up. So now, the, you know, I'm getting those things, teaching those guys more much weight. I'm training the neural system in the, in the upper back to, hey, turn these muscles on. And doing so, I'm creating this chronic kind of motor unit turning on there, which is going to, again, increase tissue stiffness, increase the muscular positioning, and drive, again, just how more adaptations occur in that back. And then at the same time, as I drop down, I'm going to drive, again, more of a maybe hypertrophy in the chest, and we have now growth, tissues are gonna change. Now, what we did overall at this point was create a individual who's one of doing bilateral work, which is common. And so we're trying to, because we're trying to lift things in a horizontal plane or straight ahead and bilaterally, what we do is we're, we're removing their muscles ability to disassociate from each other from the left to right, if you wanna look at it that way. And so now they kind of work together, which is going to decrease our spine or really for our bones, to change the shapes into one way versus the other way while the other side moves in the other direction. And so we have these tissues now that are holding these bones in place, holding the, you know, your body in this one position. And now we're losing this, we're getting wider literally as an individual because of these, these different adaptations we've just created from the bar um, where if, and so now we just, we literally can't turn because of that, because now we can, but it's like a forced turn, like, hey, do it, it's like, ah, and you, mm -hmm. but you feel the stretch drastically now. You feel so much more. It's not fluid now. It's not nice and easy because you're fighting. You want your tissue architecture in neuro neurologically now. You, you're not well set up to eccentric load one side while the other side concentric uh, concentric loads, if you will, eccentric, right? Lengthen versus decrease the firing. The motor patterns get off, and so eventually. Eventually, is that we're where I back. stopped? We're back, we're back. Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I lost you for a sec. Um, I stopped talking once I see, you freeze on my screen, I don't know what's going on here, I'm yeah. sorry. We're, no, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good. We can, I can just edit out some, some parts and make it, make it flow yeah. pretty well. And I think like, so I think, I think that stuff sometimes sounds woo to people a little bit, right? Where it's like, okay, I'm putting on muscle, I, I've, I'm I'm putting on a lot of muscle at the front. I'm starting to get squeezed from the front a little bit as well. And people can't really see how that could decrease a turn as a whole or decrease my ability to turn or could decrease my ability to turn. But when you look at it on a more local level, you say, okay, if you keep training this way for another 12 months, 24 months, now let me just look at your ability of your shoulder to turn. Can mm -hmm. you internally rotate and externally rotate? The answer is almost 100% of the time. Because you, uh, uh, so you, you, your shoulder can actually rotate less than it could 12 months ago. So why do we then presume that like your, your, this doesn't apply or your hip can, can rotate less? Why does this apply less to your whole body and how you actually turn? It doesn't. And it's just because the, the, a whole body turn or change of direction is just, a combination of turns throughout all of these joints, right? right. It's like so, a tick, 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 tick. If you look at the research, it's like, even if you look at biomechanics, like, all right, this, this vertebrae has five degrees, this one has three, then three, but together you get 50 degrees of rotation, right? So you, you slowly tick those away. You know, I can turn, but it's like, all right, I have a turn. <laughs> yeah, it's a Everything chunk. Everything turns, right, right. I think I had like, a, you take a foam roller and you do two different turns and it's like, you can have a turn where this is grab the end and you can turn long or you grab the middle and you can turn short. It's like everybody's stuck just turning around one joint versus utilizing the whole thing. And it's like the speed of that turn drastically changes then. And like, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter, right? Uh, if you have a slow turn, depends. like the, you get to build up more force, you have all this other stuff that goes along with that slower turn. 
But if your sport requires quick turns, you know, there's, there's two points to, uh, you know, mass acceleration, force and things like that and impulse. So speed is going to play a role at the same time, the time it takes to get to that speed. And so it depends on what you need. Um, so with the, I was going to say something there, cut off it for a split second. Um, it was so smart what I was going to say. You find it, you find it, you find it. I know, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Um, yeah, I think, I think when when SNC talks about like SNC principles and stuff, how important it is to get strong to maybe prevent some injuries or mitigate against injuries, then we have to maybe appreciate that adaptation. Like there can be negative adaptations as well, and maybe these. Yes, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting very strong around my knee joint, but at the same time. If I lose the ability to turn at the hip and the foot and the ankle and the spine and the pelvis and all of these things, then maybe only my knee joint is the thing that's been able, is able to turn or has is being forced to turn in this position. And at a certain stage, no matter how strong the muscles actually are, they're not going to be able to deal with the amount of force that the knee is just the only thing that's dealing with the force that should be being shared out across a ton of joints instead. So that's... um something that I think about a ton and that's something that I think neg negative transfer of training is not, is like not discussed. It does just does not get discussed. Yeah, weird, right. Like, cause like there's always some form of secondary consequence, what you do. And I like, there's, there, there is a give and take and it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to take this away. I'm going to get this and combined. I'm going to take away just enough. Or we're going to get what we want, but then people just keep going down. More is better. More is better. And it's like, no, 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 you're, you're beyond that point now. Now utilize that a different way. And it's like, there's a risk reward. Yeah, sure. I, I got a little heavier. I got a little, I got a little slower, but I got stronger, but I'm still faster than everybody. So that strength is good. Right. It's like, or, or the other way around where it's like, I, I was, I got a little, I got a little less weak. I got more weak, but I got faster, but I'm still stronger than everybody. So like, those are good. Those are good give and takes. The issue is when you take, when you go too far in one direction. Yeah. I have a couple of athletes now that I'm going to be working with for the off season who are very good footballers. And I'm going to have, I'm going to have a little bit of a battle that I think they've, I think they've lifted too much weights over the last couple of years. And I'm going to try and their clubs and organizations and stuff will want them to keep hitting certain numbers, but I think they would be a better player if they, if they scale back a little bit and just got a bit more reactive and worked on change direction and plyometrics for a full off season. Um, and just did a bit of bodybuilding work to keep, keep some muscle around the joints. That's, that's what I think. I think they've got very compressed around it spine and rib cage and the pelvis so but strength is a drug when you get stronger you feel it's so good everyone wants to do it <laughs> i didn't know it was just a u.s thing i thought it was like hey where's that america we're bigger better you know here we go i didn't know that was just a thing in the u.s but like no yeah. man it's universal when i was like 13 years of age 12 years of age i got a couple of dumbbells you know them old yellow like uh <laughs> weight play thing on a on a rusty rusty uh you can like screw them onto the screw bar on. yeah, yeah, and exactly you feel on. you feel you can see your bicep growing within like two weeks and you feel stronger and you challenge your friend to uh to an arm wrestle like <laughs> that that's addictive um and that never ends particularly yeah. i think for women as well i was going to say particularly for men but for actually now it seems like for women women are really getting into strength training in a good way um so i think it maybe it's just for everyone <laughs> yeah no without it, that's like forever small center forever weak center the stronger you get, the weaker you feel. The, 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 <laughs> the bigger you get, the smaller you feel. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. You know? um, can you describe then, so you're saying how important like the, the guts and stuff like that is. So we talked about a jump. So a counter movement jump or maybe more of a, a reactive jump. So what's happening then in a, in a change of direction, then a cut or something like that? What are, what are the guts doing? And if, I don't know how many, how many parts of this question we're going to, yeah. What are the guts doing? And then maybe what are the guts doing? If you want to, you can go into like a wider pelvis and nar narrower pelvis, because obviously they're not necessarily going dead straight down in this instance. There's a little bit of horizontal okay. force as well. So I think the simplest way to look at it is, um, again, this is uh, Bill Hartman who helped me out with this. So we talk about this in the, the AMP performance mentorship as well, but I, I teach at, but it's just like, if you take your, a glass of water or something, and like imagine that's, you know, your, your body's the, the glass, your guts are the water in there. Essentially because of, these are going up and down, so I'm not going to actually do that. But your, your body essentially spins, like it's spinning and it spins down and spins up. So it's like a, 
a vortex that kind of occurs in there. So if we're going like into a cut, essentially what I'm what we're doing is we're loading in that cut. So if we think about like the abs or the erector spine or the muscles in the abs, the city abs, right? The external obliques are going to be utilized primarily to push your guts to the other side, right? They're going to turn on, they're going to push your guts to the other side. Okay, they're going to drive things kind of back to the other side and back, if you will. You're then your like your uh, internal obliques are going to end up, their goal is to essentially push it back now at the same time, not push it from the front, push it towards the back, push toward that back pelvis. So as I'm kind of going into the cut, so let's say uh, this is this is where I'm into the cut. So this is like halfway into the cut, I'm loading into there. Everything got spun in that direction. But I had to So start. you're loading you're loading into your right leg, let's say. You say we're everything, right leg. everything so is spinning. I, I jump right to the middle part. I, I jump right to like I'm at that about to turn things around. Before yeah. that, let me jump there. Before that, so I'm reaching my leg out. I'm making that cut my right leg. I'm talking about my right leg here. Mm -hmm. I'm turning, I'm shooting now, I'm loading the side, the left side, and I'm trying to push my guts to that right side to open up. So it's like opening things, things are going up. I can externally rotate, place my foot. It's like my pelvis floor is kind of opening a little bit here. Um, things are dropping down so I can fall into that direction. I'm not trying to stop myself yet. I'm trying to move into that direction. Load into the right side a little bit. That's are spinning kind of into that position, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to hit into the ground. And as I drop, I'm going to hopefully internally rotate a little bit, start to internally rotate. And this is where, where I just talked about the EOs. All these muscles now turn on to push all that stuff back into that pelvic floor, the back inside pelvic floor. But I don't want it to go, just go there. All right, I want to delay that. I want to load it like a spring, if that makes sense, right? So this is the difference between foot, it's like a foot contact thing, all right? So I may end up hitting the ground and my foot's gonna hit on like the heel part and it's going to like open it up and then I'm gonna drop to the move and it's gonna to start to close, but now it's gonna, as it's closing, the guts are delayed. So the body moves first and the guts get slinged there a little bit later. So again, you take your glass, uh, you kind of move it, you see it kind of slosh around and back. So that's mm -hmm. what's occurring. So this is where the musculature plays, maintaining that. The guts are going to drop back down to that side. I'm going to load it. So it's going to load into that back hip, if you will. It's going to like push into the pelvic floor. But I don't want to just let it, I don't want to let it, let it fall into there. I want to delay that. So I'm going to keep that muscular on just enough so that I can utilize that spring to come back out of it, right? So I'm going to drop in. It's going to load. It's going to load. It's going to load. And then I'm going to close that guts up. It's going to kind of get wider. The guts are going to try to move. I'm going to move. And then the guts are going to spin back around. So now it goes from like the front left to the back right shooting back up to the front right, down back to the back left on that next cut. So it's like this little vortex thing, but at the same time, it's doing this up and down thing as you go. I don't, it's not super specific, right? Because we don't really know. And, and you know, I don't think anybody's actually videotaped it, but in general, um, it's going to be moving around like so, but you're going to load into it. Like wherever you are, the guts are going there like a split second later, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. And so it's like the heel hits the ground, opens up that pelvic floor, and then I start to turn out of it raise the turn, then the smashing that back into the pelvic floor and it loads it and then I get that spring out of it. The issue is when that, so does that make sense? I mean, to, me, to me, it makes sense. And, and I think it even makes sense. Like if you look at someone, if you look at a, a lean athlete or actually a fatter person <laughs> going to do a cut with their t-shirt off, like you will the skin you'll see the actually if you take a fatter someone's like fatter, just with a little bit of fat you, you yeah see you see the, the fat fork flying after them so like that's effectively a representation of what's happening with all the shit there on the inside all the stuff that doesn't have connection right mm -hmm. so that's all the things that are, that are just kind of floating around in there and mm -hmm. that's your guts that's your fat which is why fat is a performance inhibitor essentially but it also changes your timing right so now it's like you're trying to sync up that load so like the same with the gut. So this is where timing and practice comes into play. But sure, you can have all the biomechanics, you can have all the tissue prep. But if you don't know how to, oh, here it comes internally, whatever sense that transition of the gut's going to hit it, you go too fast and the guts literally stop you, right? You go to cut, you come to, and, it, and then they hit and they slowly, literally slow you down. Where it's like, oh, I got it. You catch them and you throw it back up, right? It's just like catching a ball. When you throw a ball, you can catch it or you can catch it, right? And it's like when you catch a ball with bare hand, like someone's throwing a baseball, and you can and you you don't just put your hand out there and grab it, right? I mean, sure, if you're, if you're a beast, you go with it a little you, bit. You go with it a little bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because like when I throw the rocks on my kids, right? That's how. That's, how, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an inside joke, I think. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you learn to absorb. You learn to absorb that force. Uh, yeah, that's an inside joke. I don't. I mean, I do throw rocks. <laughs> we play catch. We play catch around. Child, and, child, uh, child protection are going to come after you. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. 
So with the with the guts thing then, so I'm loading into the right leg, my foot is my foot is hit, I'm I'm kind of loading, the guts are coming a split second afterwards, then how how am I getting out of there? So like traditionally I, I would like if I was to look at a, a muscular point standpoint there, I would say like how important internal rotation is to load in that pelvis can turn over the femur a little bit. And what that's going to le- lengthen, you're going to get some length in the glute max there. Mm-hmm. The attack, like where the glute max attaches into the IT band, they're going to get a lot of tension there on the posterior lateral hip and the lateral hip. And then like that, you're going to get a bit of recoil off that to put to push you back out. Would you still think about something like that there or how would you, t- how would you describe like the, the coming back out of the cut then? No, exactly. Like you're saying, like you, you load in that side, you want that tension, like the tension's good. And this is where I, this Sorry. is the, go again. You so you load into that. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on, but yes. Uh, are we there? Are we good? One sec. Okay, try now. Okay. So, yes, like I, I, I think exactly how it is. You load into that side. You want that tension. That tension is going to be what we consider the elasticity, the storage of energy, the spring. You can go into a cut and not have that tension, but you're just going to fall, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to fall in that direction, or you're going to stop. If you feel the tension, it's going to dissipate. You want to utilize that. Same thing happens within that pelvic floor and the guts. As we drop into that side, we're going to open it up, say the glutes, you know, that's going to be on the back end of the pelvis, right? They open up enough where the guts can kind of swing into there. And then as we kind of load it, we load that up, I'm there. And then as soon as that gut hits, I'm going to start pulling that guts, pushing that guts with me, right? But it's still coming almost towards that side as I'm going in the opposite direction. So the guts are still going to go towards that side. It's loading. So it's almost getting wider, right? And then we hit a point where it's like, boom, now I'm throwing it. And my body's going to move a little bit faster. Then the guts are going to come back around. And it's going to repeat the process again on the other side. Mm-hmm. Again, I will say Bill Hartman has a great video of this on his YouTube page for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but my big thought was you just take like a water bag, a water ball, a glass, and do a little spin, stop it on one end, right? Load it up. Like if you think about pitchers or most walking in general, starting something like we want to utilize this energy. Most movement starts with like from standstill, a walk in the opposite direction before we go forward, right? It's like a load one side and go forward because you're trying to get the guts moving, power four up, power four down, mm-hmm. one side, other side. A pitcher, why do they throw faster, usually out of wind up versus a, uh, the, uh, a, a, a stay stride? I don't even know what to call it. Honestly, I don't know if I'll speak in a while. But you throw part of a wind up because you slosh things around, slosh things around, and it's like whip versus like slosh go. And, and as you get a little bit more speed when you can kind of build things up. That's why you spent, I mean, there's momentum and things like that, but that, that's part of it, right? Momentum, and that's part of the internal process of controlling your, your innards yeah. to make that happen. And that's what's low, low, low. You're just building a ton of potential energy and then you turn to kinetic energy. Yeah. I was literally, before we came on, I was looking at a, a shot putter. And it's so interesting to see what, he was doing just but no different to anyone else, any other good shot putter but I've just the video came up for some reason and I slowed it down and just to see him starting to create momentum and like spin and spin and spin and he basically like he 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 had free he freezes all degrees of freedom from the foot all the way up um actually all the way up through his body once he creates that initial bit of momentum he just starts to spin spin faster and faster and he's just spinning on like the ball of his foot mm-hmm. And there's no relative motion, I would say, almost anywhere in his body. But the gut, I think the gut, he's just accelerating how the guts are moving. And then when he wants to, when he's ready, he can actually use that and direct that in a certain, in, in a direction. Internal momentum with the external load, but from the ball, whatever, like the shot mm-hmm. put, whatever it is, like the angle, this drives that spin at that point. Yeah. Like there's not much going on. He's just pushing it. You may have a little bit of a, may have a little bit of a, uh, kick with the leg but for the most part yeah it's just you lock you get that spin get the spin it's like ride it ride it ride it but then you have to be strong enough now stop right you gotta have that ability to turn it all on to stop the momentum right away and then shoot that ball out where it needs to go yeah so interesting um so how yeah and this it might, it might not be there might not be any any answer or difference here but like so that that wider pelvis versus that narrower pelvis far a cut with regards to the guts then is there something of note that you would think about for change of direction for those those type of people 
So I can ask that again for some reason. That. So the wider, so the wider pelvis that we spoke about, or the narrower pelvis and the guts and the change of direction. Is there anything of note that you would think of for those different types of people that like this is happening differently for one versus the other? Um, or is it just that that narrower person might be just quicker getting out of the gut because they can pressure it quicker? That's most I was gonna be. So like from visual, like from internally, the narrow person is probably going to be quicker on the turn because they're better at turning. So it's like gonna have they're gonna have less excursion in general. But uh, at the same time, it depends on like you know variable apples to apples. They're gonna have less of a turn. They're also gonna have from a visual standpoint, they probably won't have as far of a reach with the leg. I feel like widers have tended to have a little bit more uh, frontal plane, if you will. I put air quotes, but abduction. Plane. So they're reaching out further. They'll, they'll, go, they'll be a little bit further. They'll be a little, and the wider's going to drop a little bit deeper um, in that cut. And they're going to be more of a slower slash powerful. It's going to be a harder turn, a wider turn. You're not going to expect so like someone who's doing a lateral lunge, even if you look at it that way, like someone doing a lateral drop, a wider's going to have a leg far more. Their, their upper body's going to turn a lot more. It's going to look visually like it turns more where a narrow is not going to have as much of a, of a drop, right? They'll probably have a little bit more force and angle on a narrow um, just because they're better at going more vertical. Yeah. Um, and so they'll utilize those forces better than like the horizontal, if you will. Yeah. So wide just wants to be wider. And wide narrow wants. Wider. Yeah. And it, like you get the goals to like make it work because some lines, some narrows are too narrow where they don't, they don't know how to get into the cut enough, right? They're yeah. just in and out. They're trying to turn too fast. They need to learn how to drop a little more IR, a little more of that with narrow, a uh, wide may struggle with uh, getting out of that or like spending too much time there. Like we yeah. need you to, you know, you're, you're thinking your butt's going too far back. You're, you're hinging too much. We need to get you faster and start turn around getting that energy a little bit quicker. Yeah. And, that, and then the, the, the uh, funnel shape, so wide pelvis, narrow top versus wide top, narrow bottom, really, really plays into that in regards to like someone who has that wide bottom, they're slow out of that. They're super slow. Mm -hmm. um, and you're really trying to work on someone getting out of that cut a lot, a lot more at that point. Mm -hmm. Rarely am I saying you're, you're not going low enough on that. Yeah. But it's, it's like you're, you need to get out of there some way, but don't want to do this sort of thing to get out of it. I, I was throwing my shoulder. They're trying to use their upper body versus pushing with their lower body to get, because they have tension up. They can create tension up top because it's so tight. So yeah. they're going to utilize this like almost like dragging the lower body behind to get out of the cut versus actually pushing into the ground at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like the what? Yeah, the more I see it, the wides want to be wide, the narrows want to be narrow. And they're gonna be. It's just yeah. Yeah, don't go too far. Like depending yeah. on what your goals, like you may want to, you know, manipulate that a little bit. Yeah, I have a client. I have a client that want like the one of the narrowest people I've seen, and they come in or she comes in, she stands there talking to me with her arms folded and her feet together. Narrow, like they're just like just like the narrowest pole you can ever like and just talks to me like that and then there's a white person that comes in afterwards a white guy and it's just like not arms folded like chest pushed out hands on the hips yeah feet pointing out to the side like just yeah just making themselves as wide as possible it's so 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 interesting how yeah i don't know it's, it's just, it, it is what it is and like you want to and i get it and I, i've had this conversation some other people and it's like people want oh we, we can have it all you can do whatever you want but no you, you really can't it's like but it's th th not saying you can't achieve a ton of stuff right mm -hmm. it's just like you're just not going to be that guy because you're not but you know you're lim you literally have physical limitations right there's there's something holding you back but very few people actually work hard enough to maximize their genetic potential like it, it takes it takes effort to really hit your hit your threshold and so it's like, you can push yourself really hard, but understand like your achievements probably gonna be a little bit differently than what you are striving for based on who you look at. Like if I'm looking at, like dealing with kids, a lot of that comes out. I was like, I want to be like him. Like look at a different player, please. Like, <laughs> he's, yeah. him, he's still an all-star, but don't look at that guy. Go look at this guy. Cause you're not going to be him. You're not him. You know, as mm -hmm. they say, and it's like, you, you need to look this direction because you, you just won't have that skill set mentally. Sure. Take that mentality. You like that mentality, but physically the gifts that this guy has, you don't, you don't have the structure for it. But the other all-star on this team, you definitely have the same structure for that. Focus more on that athlete. You'll be much happier in the end. Yeah, yeah. And that's why sport, like, with it's great to see sports where there's different types of structures. And at the end of the day, like, technical and tactical ability in most sports is 
pretty much every sport is the most important um you know um okay tell me tell me so i will i will give you a chance now greg to talk a bit more about your course i might leave the part out from the start because i think we've done a good job of uh of maybe talking about some of this stuff and then if there's gaps that you want to fill in or talk about then let us let us know what's going to be in a course like that okay so in general what we talk about in regards to like the hips and things like that the loading the eccentric the yielding the cash in the guts all these things are based in science and like understanding like how these connective tissues and how the muscles all work together and understanding like Am I trying to drive changes to the contractile elements versus contract the connective tissue elements within the muscle itself? Many times we always talk about, oh, we have the tendons, right? We're talking about the tendons and the connective tissues and like their stiffness and elasticity. But the muscles also have those same qualities. And it's the like they're all wrapped, they're wrapped in the stuff, epimesium, paramecium, and endomecium. They all have the same, very similar makeup to uh, the tendons. And so the course really goes into explaining how to differentiate between training the muscles, the contract elements, getting the adaptation of contract elements versus the neuromuscular facility, like the motor unit recruitment, things like that, and then also the connective tissue elements. So all three of those are going to drive different levels of adaptations and, and provide different benefits. So essentially, you can take a squat, the exact same squat, back squat if you want to, and adjust how it's going to affect the connective tissue elements or the muscular elements or the neuromuscular elements just by changing speed, load, um, time under tension, rest periods, all these things can be adjusted. And you can run the squat for like 10 weeks or like say like four or five cycles without changing the, the exercise itself, but completely changing the adaptations you get from it because of these different elements and understanding how to address them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really what the course as a nutshell really covers. And then from rehab basic, understanding how to utilize it as well. We go into a little bit of biomechanics, having a bit of a biomechanics background. So like uh, having a little bit of the DGR stuff, DGR interactive stuff, um, and good, mentorship good, stuff, good, something like that. It will be very- Good, good name drops. Yeah, it'll be good. We'll be, uh, <laughs> will be very useful because of, it doesn't, I don't fully go into the whole biomechanics of ERIR, but when you do understand those, you'll understand why you would place someone in a very specific position to do an exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, this is what's going on with the, uh, connective tissue elements versus much contractile elements versus neuromuscularly, right? It's like, oh, I can do, I'm good at producing force here, but if I put them here and try to produce force, odds are it's going to come from this location, right? And I'm going to drive the changes there, which is where I actually want it. Um, so that's one of the big things about, and this goes back into understanding how, how to get in a cut, adjusting why your, the structure is with someone who's, a, who's a wider up top or narrow and why the muscles and why they react a certain way because it's just the overall time of tension and connective tissues and how they adapt just to that body position and how the forces are on them. Okay. So for example, then can you just Thank take you. a, bring me that, like ask me the right question after I say, uh, blah. I don't know. No, no, the blah is good. And then my job is to try and is to try and, um, for, for me, like put con, you know, put context on the information. That's what I always try and do. So like you, like you said, the back squat, then can you give us an example of, okay, if you do a back squat this way, you might get this type of adaptation versus like, so if you want to, if you yeah. want to take speed of loading or, so, or something yeah, okay. like that, so let's two different, ex so same, same, same exercise, two different examples. Okay. So when we have the bathtub, we understand like we're putting the backstory and people are going to have relative strength. So let's say you have relative strength. The lighter you are, the more relative motion you're going to have. So the more degrees of freedom from a movement, you're going to get deeper technically, hopefully through full relative motion in a back squat with a lighter load. And so I put a back squat on and I do a lighter road. We're going to say, hey, let's shoot for reps. So we're early in the season and we're going to try to drive changes that we want from a expansive nature. We want to increase their expansion, but I have to do a back squat. We're saying, all right, we have to do a back squat. There's other squats I will do, but you have to do a back squat here. What we're going to focus now more on is not necessarily tempo, but we're looking at lighter weight, higher reps, achieving full position, probably with a hill elevation. We can take away the hill elevation if we want to. Um, based on constraints so we can keep it completely the same but understanding like the back squat itself is going to drive a certain physiological change like for you have to be in a certain bony shape to get that now what if i'm trying to focus on again increasing range of motions increasing expansion take away what they did during the season so I'm just going to say a basketball player i'm going to hit a higher rep timed exercise here so we're going to hey we're going to shoot for 60 seconds to 90 seconds right 
we're going to bang out these reps and we're going to go over slow. What we're going to drive here is keeping the weight light enough that they can kind of almost relax all the way down and come all the way back up. So what we're trying to do is we can do a box even potentially on this one as well. Um, but again, squats are anything we have. Sorry, back squats. So again, like, squat. you, you have to like the idea, right? And so what we're driving here is we're going to focus more on, you'll get a lot more of like glycogen storage, you're gonna get a lot more contractile, uh, you're gonna get a lot more expansion with connective tissue. So they're gonna become less stiff. You're gonna drive more joint ranges of motion. You're gonna do all this with this higher rep time. And it's gonna be relative time when you, form is gonna be the breakdown really of this. So if you see someone break form, start getting a little bit lower back or a little bit more, but starts to get more towards a, a good morning, you pull them. So you can use that as a KPI. That's going to drive again, a little bit more expansive nature from a, you know, so I'm not actually gonna get a lot of muscle growth um, because it's not, I'm not pushing them that hard. I'm allowing the actual joint to go through its full excursion. So now let's move into, all right, we wanna drive some muscle growth, right? I'm gonna load up that bar a lot more to a certain extent that makes sense. I still want a decent amount of range of motion. I still want them to go through a decent amount of major, but now how they're gonna get there, I'm going to allow for a stiffer movement. So I may not, when I drop into this, this the lower part of the squat, I may not want my knees to translate back, my uh, tibias to translate back as much. I may want them to constantly go forward, but my knee to continually to bend. What this is going to do is drive a lot more stretch within the muscle tissue. So now I'm actually creating this shear force, creating this stress, pulling things and this is going to be less of a response saying hey look we don't have enough muscle to protect ourselves so now i'm going to elicit a muscle building response this is going to be set reps games again you can always use time or fatigue as the number but this is going to be your more traditional what you would look in a back squat i will still focus on form as much as you can and make sure it doesn't become too good morning e because then we're going to start hypertrophying the back more versus the actual like to say the quads what we're shooting for here mm -hmm. um and so what we're gonna focus on that to get a good stretch through there because now we're eliciting a different response. So now let's say we wanna move into more of the power generation of things. Same thing with the back squat, we're staying with the back squat. Now what we're gonna do is we're working on, we'll say not even just power, more of the, we'll say power. Let's say power without losing too much of a uh, range of motion quality to it, right? So it's a little bit of give and both. And so from here we'll do like, we'll drop the weight down again. Right, because we don't need to wait, but now we're going to use momentum. So now we're going to decrease the speed at, or increase the speed that we lower. So now it's going to be almost like a little drop counter movement jump with that squat, but it's not necessarily a jump, but you'll drop quickly, catch yourself, and come back up. So now we're going to listen to, we're still going to probably potentially get some hypertrophy because we essentially have to eccentrically position the muscles to drop down that position. And then as we go to turn them back on to stop that drop, I won't be able to turn the muscle on fast enough to prevent some shearing of the tissues. So we may get some shearing there. Now, again, you're not going as heavy as you did before with the hypertrophy phase, but you're also not going as light as you were with the, with the high rep phase potentially. Um, depending on the athlete, they may have it's a relative strength thing as long as form looks decent. And so now here what I'm driving to do, I'm gonna keep the reps low. It's just gonna repeat it, repeat it, like two, two to five, two to three reps per set, five to 10 sets, right? We're just bang, bang, bang. And what we're trying to do here now, we don't want any time type of growth within the connective tissue. We don't want really too much break on the muscle, um, but we want to elicit a response just enough to get the connective tissue stiffer here, get them, teach the neuromuscular aspect to turn on more motor units at a time, but without having to add more bulk to the athlete. Um, and so now we're going to train now a stiff connective tissue, essentially a more compressive neuromuscular system, but allowing it to relax. And so now we're teaching it to create neuromuscular compression, if you will, uh, creating more tension through the muscles, through the more motor units, while also listening a stiffer tissue. So this is going to drive a stiffer tissue connectively, not there's a more of a connective tissue, neuromuscular, non-contractile workout there. And we're just trying to drive that. You should be pretty fresh when you're done with that type of exercise. Um, but you should also hit a point where like you're slower out of the drop. And that's where you know for sure you're done. It's a little bit hard visually. That's why I just keep it low. Yeah. So you don't have to run into that. Yeah. Um, but you do like five to 10 sets of like two to three reps because you don't want to, all you're doing is triggering, hey, look, we're putting stress, we're putting stress, we're putting stress, mm -hmm. put more uh, animal crossing to these, uh, to the connective tissue of the muscle. There's, there's no pause at the bottom. No pause. It's yeah. drop back up. Dropping up. Yeah. Drop. We're yeah. trying to teach you to come back as quick as possible. Again, yeah. you don't want to be super heavy here because of different tensions, but that's why you drop the weight down. So at the bottom, it may be similar weight to what you're doing on hypertrophy from a momentum. You may have to create about maybe the same amount of impulse. Mm -hmm. um force you should try to create almost a similar empathy to come back up right and so it's this, this weight where you drop down and, and pull you and push yourself back up but you still move quickly so yep. it's not delaying the amount of uh uh force you have on your tissues right um 
yeah so that's that's how i that's how that's how i kind of look at it like the, the course of the goal is to understand a little bit more on why that works yeah love it that, that works well as a rehab model i think you know so 100 that's it's not it's actually not that dissimilar to some of the stuff the squat part of the workshop of my workshop where i have like um yeah we move from like a, a slower where we're really pressing through the floor then there's like a drop and catch variation or a drop and and then it's um like a yielding plyometric type of variation it's not that it's not that dissimilar except the difference is you go into detail and explain them why you do it uh, yeah, I, was like, I really like what you did i was like oh this is like that's why i was really super happy about the workshop too it was like you know, like oh this is like this is right up my alley in regards to your programming and it's like i gotta understand why you would do that and like that's where you know, like the different hinges, you know, driving different changes, like the, the hinges you teach is like, yeah, that was different than anything I've, I've done. Um, and that was, I think I, and I've run through my head, like, why would that be different than like a stagger stance versus kickstand? Like stagger stance, I think the loaded foot is back, um, where the kickstand, like the loaded foot is front. And it's more of a drop back, right? It's more heel heavy on the, on the, on the stagger, a little bit more. On the stagger. I think the stagger, just on that, I think the stagger, I think, did I get asked this in the workshop? I think the stagger gets more of the sacral fibers of the, of the glute max and the yes and that stuff around there whatever other stuff is around there and i think the kickstand one opens the posterior capsule and like yes. the most meaty part of the glute max yep. more than anything else yeah. i've, I've I seen think look at it as like again this is where it comes to understanding like the difference between muscle orientation and like are we dri- where are we driving right like it's like when you're doing that staggered it's like you almost don't want tension as you go down mm. because you're trying to just get pure relative motion between every single aspect of that joint mm. there but you're trying almost like falling into it so you're trying to really fall into it don't get muscle growth don't you don't you don't really get hypertrophy right you're not going to wear a nice booty with something like that but mm-hmm. you're going to have motion off and get into there now right mm-hmm. where what you're having with the kickstand you're training the body by so hard to coach because like you know you mentioned yourself like you got to coach it right it's like you have to coach this one up because it's it's a, you're hitting like every element of the muscle at that point. You're driving, hey, look, neurologically at least enough, right? Because we're holding you almost in a position where you're transitioning into a, you're delaying that hinge. So you have to slowly get, but because of that, you're also now get the pull on the tight end and put the pull on the, the contractile elements of connective tissue to elicit, hey, we need growth. But then you're stretching the connective tissue because of this slowly give and you're forcing this position to get a good stretch. But then that adds a growth because you're essentially forcing it into a position that is, like to grow up muscle again, for me, it's like you have to maintain like a constant orientation, but then move into a position that would be eccentric, mm-hmm. but you have to actually have that joint move. And that's kind of what's going on, but you're delay, you're just delaying, delaying, delaying enough. So it's like hard, but then when you come back, that's when you get that shake is because now you're moving into a new position. Yeah. You didn't necessarily have that position before. And then you go back and you get, again, it's like, you get these shakes because you're tr- the neuro- neurologically, it's just not there. Like it just- it ha- I was trying to figure it out. Before, right? yeah. It's hanging on, you create the stress and the connective tissue, just from that drop, and now as you come back up, it's like, oh, wait, we have to fill in more, more area. Yeah. And it's like, oh, let's try to do that. So, I mean, I think it's great. Like, I, th- I think it's like, I always come like a more athletic based, more functional based hinge than like a, a kickstand would be, or a, a stagger. Yeah. And, but like stagger is good for rehab, stagger for pain management, um, stagger, you know, things like that. Um, and I think it's good for like grasping, potentially increasing that area quickly-ish. But then when you go, if you go from a stagger to a kickstand, that doesn't mean he's going to be good at kickstand. Because of the all because what we just talked about now and mm-hmm. how many other elements that plays. And so it's, it's interesting. I like the way you break it down and what goes through your mind there. Um, I had someone, I had like a, a power lifter say that the kind of passive aggressively that the kick kickstand hinge, like you're you're it's not even training, it's just a sensory exercise and it's not even training. I have like pictures of clients that have grown <laughs> grown their glutes. I, he said something like, oh, I can deadlift three times body weight. You don't think that's training my glutes? And I'm like, you've been doing that for 15 years. And this client that I just trained, this child that I just did a kickstand hinge with for two months has a bigger glute than you. And he hasn't done anything else. Uh, so it's just, I don't know. It's, 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 it's not a sensory thing. It's, it's a lot more than that. Um, okay. What's the name of the course? What's the name of your course? Oh, uh, the name of the course is Muscles Still Matter. Uh, uh, muscular principles of programming, how movements, uh, how movement is created and adapted. The names are always the hardest part. To, yeah, they're so to long. Cre- 
I just went with lower body basics. That was what I... <laughs> right, that's what I thought. Hey, that's what you do. Hey, keep it simple. Keep it simple. I was like, muscle stuff. I would say that, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, that's muscle. I don't know that's enough. Muscle. I don't know that's enough. <laughs> I mean, that's what it should be. Say, yeah, muscle stuff, you know. Yeah, but then when someone gets into the course, they're like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is way more than I bargained for. No. 100%. Exactly, man. Exactly, yeah. man. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. So it's going to be, it's going to be like a couple of hours long of, material um kind of a self-paced thing very much so yeah so it's like a you know kajabi teachable uh if you're gonna run, you run a ggr interactive it's like it has the bullet points um yeah. so it's just up there uh i try to break it down the symbols like hits the click snip snippets here and there um some video pro some video uh breakdown of certain things but it's like yeah it's about an hour and a half two hours um in, in there and i'm uh yeah yeah i'll just keep it cool, man. excellent um really good well when when you um when you came to the workshop and just chatting and stuff i i, I got along very well with you and i was very impressed with you so um really so, yeah. so yeah so yeah david gray is a genuine human being i'll say that right now like he's, uh, <laughs> he is who he is he says what he says and, it, it, and overall it makes it he's a you're, you're a good person man like it's Thank you, sometimes man. you go to these courses right and you run into the some people teaching and like you know kind of fool himself like uh um uh, you know stick to yourself but you were right there in the in the, in the weeds with us you know before and after you know so it was it was, it was good to see was good to i see. was i was born the weeds man um, <laughs> I'm, stay, I'm staying here um anything in particular from the workshop that you've used i don't mean this as a promotion but like 100%. anything you've uh, like your plyometric progression stuff and the hand kicks in the hinge honestly like i use like everything from your workshop not gonna lie like it's just everything's usable i got track athletes for me it's like that was huge for track athletes some of the stuff you mentioned um just from training them differently with the hinges, the kickstand, understanding how that matters um, on how we do it. So like we were doing certain things like versus different phases of training, essentially, like where are we going to work on working acceleration? Are we working on max velocity, right? Um, I'm adjusting now how I work those uh, d different uh, hinges now. So like I, I used, uh, I used it a lot more now. And then the plyometric progression though was huge for me. That was, again, like that was worth the course itself is how you progress the, the plyometrics and the understanding of why you do it and how you programmed it. I think that was very, very useful. Sweet, man. Thank you. I don't, uh, I didn't mean that to be a, a promo, but it's just interesting to ask like what I think I should, I would actually like to ask like everyone maybe six months after the course, cause like, you know, what do you, what are you using here or what are you not using? Yeah. Because you've probably same as me you've like, this is all great and then a month later you're like no i don't use anything that i learned anymore yeah. so yeah, 100 like you just use it and like even then i, I mean i've seen i've already seen within what the four weeks was one of the kids like just coaching a little bit differently from a queuing standpoint like some changes so it's mm -hmm. like all right it's there but like you take up you come off a course yeah you're gonna use it right away if you understand like it depends on where you are right some people can't use it right away I'm, I'm blessed enough to know, like, I've taken so many at this point where I pretty much know what I'm use in the course while I'm coming out of it. That yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And so, but I don't know if it's going to work yet. I have to program it and they see the, the adaptations occur. Yeah. And so, like, you may take it, like, oh, for six weeks, you're not using it, but like, I got nothing. Yeah. And it's like, so now it's like either, one, well, you applied it wrong. <clears throat> you either applied it wrong, still froze. We're, Sorry, back. We're back. We're back. Yeah, We're back. back. It's like either you applied it wrong or like uh, it just doesn't work. And sometimes you don't know. And yeah. so, and that can be difficult. That's why I, I do think following up afterward is, is good. It's like, I know. Oh, yeah. We have yeah. a call. We have a call mm -hmm. tomorrow. tomorrow. Is it? Are you coming on? Yep. You better be there, man. Yeah, um, I do have a question to ask. So, you know. All right. Okay. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my thing, though. I ask questions. Like, I was just, uh, I had an PRI class this weekend yeah. and I asked all the questions. And, like, I was, I was a question answer of the class, right? I'm like, I'm done. If I'm showing up, I ask questions. Like, now, yeah. now that I know a lot of stuff, more stuff than I did when I, when I first took this class, you're going to get a pepper of questions. And they did a great job of answering, actually. Yeah. But it was just like, you got to ask questions. Like, because you want to leave that course, right? Knowing something. You don't want to yeah. go, like, oh, I should have asked that. Like, don't. That's the worst feeling because then you like get a wait or pay to go see it again, right? We can easily ask that question. And again, a lot of a lot of courses don't have a very good Q and A in regards, like even post, right? A lot of times, like you try to email, us, it's such a hassle just to get a question answered, right? Because it's so, anyways. Yeah, God, if, I, I no, you're right. Especially, I think, especially when you're at maybe the level where you're at, 
you might actually be only going to a workshop for not not going for one thing, but when you find the thing that someone says at a workshop, you're like, that's fucking it. I like I that's that alone. I got it and I needed that. And maybe you need to ask a question around that and yeah. chew on that. And that genuinely could change big time. Necessarily change everything, but that could make change a big part of your pro process. Could just change how you view movement or change how you view something. So very much so. To to go to courses to ask questions and like I, I, I get frustrated when someone's like, "Do you think that course would be worth it for me to go there?" I'm like, if you pick up one thing and your career is thirty years long and that one thing frames the next thirty years, even if it's a a neck client or a shoulder client and it's one thing to do with the shoulder, of course it was fucking worth it. Because you, you don't know, like it's hard to answer that question. Like, and I literally went to this course this weekend. Like, I want these three things answered. Yeah. Like I don't care about anything else. I'm like, all right, like, I need the, and I, I got an answer. So I'm like, bet. Like I was like, it was worth it no matter what. Yeah, Cause like I, I came in, like, I got to know these things. And I was like, I'm going to ask this question no matter what, you know, like one was after I had to ask like in between a break. Right. Cause it was like completely unrelated to like, well, the people that were in the class the first time taking, yeah. it would have, it, it was combining a bunch of different things. And like, this would have been over their head. And so like, I was, I let, I led myself to that question in the end. And then on the break, I said, Hey, look, I have a question for you. And like, they were very genuine about here. Yes, this is why he said that's a great question. I've actually never been asked that question. And it's probably something important, right? But it's, it took me taking that course before, putting all these other courses together, taking all the other courses I've taken outside of that to come to this one question. But it's such an important question to me in regards to just how certain things moved. And like, like if you're full of shit, partially it was like, are you full of shit? Because this doesn't make any sense, right? And it's like, it's just, it is like, what is like, for me, it was like a threshold question and like, how much am I going to take the rest of this course and, and like really like engage it or not? Um, and are, you going, are you going to tell us what the question was? Oh, no, it was just like, so like, <laughs> you're teasing us. It's the most important question in the well, history of the world. Fair, but it was just like, <laughs> for me, it was like, so like, it's, it's essentially because I was comparing like, you know, the models I've gone through in the past and this now. And so like the glute max and looking at it on the very different levels of why are you, why are you training the glute Max this way versus this plane, this action versus this action, and this. So it was like three different. So there's two different things in the program in in, uh, in the pelvis course, and it's like the glute max, like the inferior fibers versus superior fibers, and it pushes versus pulls. And then, but then there was a stretch that they had in there, and I'm like, this doesn't make sense on why we stress these things. And I was like, that was a big thing for me. And I'm like, is I, this I the, think is I this know the, why. Is this the right glute max then? It, we're yeah, yes, right glute max, right? And then there's a stretch within their program to do a right glute max stretch in the mission. And it's mm -hmm. like, but technically you're trying to turn the glute max on. So like, and it's like, so you're doing this PC. It's like, it's not PC. It's for this. It's for you lack abduction. And so this is just the internal rotation fibers slash hip extension fibers of the glute max, which uh, will lie between the ischium and the femur. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so tell me what, and like, for me, I'm like, are you just stretching these parts here? But they don't break it down like that. Like they just say this, this. And so like, there's this exercise that they teach, but they don't ever explain like, why am I doing this? Like, when should I use this? What's the reasoning behind this? And they, oh, this way, but it never added up. And so for me, it's like, I need to answer this question specifically because I have my whole, and this is based on my whole thought process, a bunch of things. And she was able to answer it. It's like, oh, we're stressing this specific thing. This is why you do it this way. And she broke it down, money. Like, it's like, you couldn't refute it, right? She was like, you drop, drop your hip forward here. You sit here, you drop here. So then it's forced to create this. This should create this abduction or adduction of the issue. There's going to allow for abduction of the, Okay. of the uh femur and so like that's why you do it so when you have this positive this positive this much like you know they work their algorithm down and it's like but when this is positive and all these other things are negative this is probably going to use that stretch you're going to uh -huh. see the increase in here and this and it's like then you should feel also these glute fibers turn on more because you can now get this action and i was like that was the breakdown and i was like mm -hmm. i appreciate that question is just like she's like no one she, and she said that was a really good question because that is confusing it could be complicated but people aren't ready for it sometimes when you have to break it down to mm -hmm. that level yeah. and i was like but for me, like, like that was just like, why use this trick? I like it, and I'm like, it, it works at certain times, but like, I don't know why I'm utilizing it. I, I have to follow your algorithm for me to get there. Yeah. And it's like, and it wasn't even good. It was like, I'm not getting this, so I'm gonna do inhibition, like how they say it. And now I was like, oh, now I know I can kind of work that in when I like with the performance, and I may not have a program because I now can see it somewhere else yeah. and through different actions. It's like, oh, we're gonna do this. I don't have to put you on the table to check it to figure it out. Mm -hmm. It's really and interesting. Then, yeah. You, you, the one thing you can be sure is if there's something there in a, like a PRI thing, whether you agree with it or not, Ron definitely has an answer for it. <laughs> for why it's there. I know that. I know that for sure. <laughs> Sometimes I just teach it right away. Like, I mean, the dude's, the dude's out there. He's yeah. like, 
he's so smart. And I've been talking about that before. He's a whole other level. Yeah. But like, yeah, yeah. So, like, so like, la- la- last thing on that before I leave you go. So this, the inferior glute max you're saying it is more of a puller then? Yeah. Versus- so I mean, I'm going to grab my pelvis. Sorry. I know it's like a podcast, but <laughs> I can, if I'm holding it, I can like look at it. Oh, yeah. So it's like you got your, your fibers here. So you got these guys. And you have these guys. So right? the, so hang on now. Guys. You have to describe these guys versus these oh, guys. So yeah, these yeah, guys yeah. are inferior. So the inferior guys are gonna lie essentially. So let's make it down to three. There's probably like five muscles in honesty. Mm-hmm. Um the inferior glute fiber, the fibers are gonna grab the like between the, the sacrum and the ischia. Yeah. They're gonna push the guts forward, closing up the ischium. Yep. Moving the sacrum and ischium close together. The so they're gonna pull those together. If you yep. go push the guts, pull the muscles. Make sense? Yep. The superior glute fibers lie more superiorly, obviously, right? And I visually see this as, as like they're going to push the sacrum forward and in. Yeah. So they're going to drive a lot of turn to the opposite side. Yeah. And so they're going to push the bones at this point. They're going to push this, they're going to push this, going to push everything this way. So it almost moves as a unit ish. <clears throat> this helps there. And then you have the, the extra fibers that we just talked about for the question. And that actually, it almost looks like it's part of the inferior glute max. But once it hits the set issue, it almost becomes a whole separate muscle. Okay, yeah. This little guy. And that is going to drive essentially an adduction of the femur and an adduction of the osseum. So going to pull. Oh, yeah. That, and it's going to push fluid anterior. Yeah. It's going to lead to an extension. Yeah. And so when you have this little guy, then get it. So you can get, so if we can't internally rotate the femur on a acetabulum or like a, um, or like get full like flexion or abduction, like those sort of things. So this is like a combo muscle almost, but this is a capsular joint one. And so I feel like when you're doing that hinge, I'm sure you're kind of getting a, a yank of that as well. Mm-hmm. But that guy is like a good for end stage, but you're going to lose like, that's that force, that transition almost like later, the later stage of gait as you're moving, transitioning out of, a mid phase and a later phase, it's like that plays a role in that you can stuck there. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. That's because I've never had great success with PRI right glute max exercises where I can get like glute max to burn and turn on doing some of their exercises like incredibly well. But I just have always found like I, I if I hinge the, someone and do it well and teach the muscle to really lengthen and then shorten again, that seems to have been more beneficial but actually maybe they're doing some of that as well that's what or they're not against some of that maybe but no no I, that's a big thing like again like the whole core we talk about that separately but it's mm-hmm. that this one was enlightening now that i knew what to ask yeah <laughs> yeah right and well, so i was like okay lori lori created the course i think so since she really put it together and so she yeah. taught this one and so she was able to answer every everything yeah. And she's a she's a fine human being, very very good person. That's brilliant, man. What um, where can people find you, Greg? Uh, so yeah, on uh, Insta, all social media, so really just Instagram, now, obviously. Um, foreign training and therapy, and then also I work with uh, Amp Education, Amp Amp uh, Performance. So we have a mentorship uh, that we do as well currently. Um, I know the next one starts up probably after this podcast released um, on October seventeenth is when it starts. Um, but if it gets out beforehand, then October seventeenth, sign up. Definitely see me there. Um, and I think that's it currently, uh, right now I'm at one step away athletics in Georgia. If you have to be in middle Georgia, stop on by, uh, we do, I do the off field performance and wellness, uh, here and, and there's a basketball gym and I do that sort of training and I should have some hopefully products coming out, but you'll find that through my Instagram and my website, which is thorn training therapy.com. Okay. Beautiful man. Any final words? Uh, no, I'd say if you have anything with David Gray, definitely take it. Like, he's a good dude. I will say that. And then know your muscles. That's the big thing. Know your muscles and uh, don't, be for, don't be scared to fail. Like, yeah, that's part of the process. Awesome, man. Greg, you're a legend. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you, sir. Hey, guys. David here. Hope you really enjoyed that episode with Greg. I thought it was a cracker. Really fun. Learned a lot. Um, gave me a bit to think about with the guts and all that stuff. So I've been seeing that more and more recently and trying to figure it out and greg definitely had piece piece some of the puzzle there for me as well um so reminder dj interactive is there if you're interested in learning biomechanics like this um where it's like video it is literally interactive you can talk with other members in our facebook group you can
Hey guys, David here again. I hope you really, really enjoyed that episode with Greg. I thought it was a cracker, really fun, um, tons to take away from it. And it definitely should hopefully challenge how you view movement and think about it's more than just what's going on at the surface level. There's so much more going on underneath the hood. And that has a massive impact on how we move, how we view movement, how we work with people who want to improve how they, how they move. So uh, one last reminder, DJ Interactive is there. If you're interested in biome- learning about biomechanics, things like this, movement, rehab, coaching, we've 700 coaches and therapists in there learning every week. If you have 15 minutes, I guarantee you, you have 15 minutes a week that you could dedicate to it. And I think it's the world's best. It's been said it's the world's best biomechanics education by, by me and maybe some others as well. So uh, DJ Interactive, it's in the show notes or you can just type it into your phone. Apart from that, give the episode a share if you can or a like or um, a five star or something like that. It would help me. It would help my Greg. It would, it would help my Greg. It would help Greg, uh, my Greg, and it would help the other guests as well. So, and it would help the podcast grow and get more guests as well. So uh, apart from that, hope you have a good week and I'll hopefully see you guys next week.